Welcome to the world famous Prospect Avenue podcast. I am your host, Chris Baker, here in the bunker in lovely Hamburg, New York. And I'm a little irritated this week. Not going to lie. You know, last week when we were recording, it was high 70s, low 80s. Weather was gorgeous. We were getting some fall golf in, very few leaves on the ground. And a week later, here we are. And it's cold, it's wet, it's been raining, it's windy. I'm getting a cold. I can already feel it. Uh, just, you know, wet paw prints in the kitchen with the dogs. It's not, it's not good. It's not a good time of year. Like, I understand the fall foliage is pretty, and I love doing a nice fall drive and cruising around on a Sunday afternoon or, you know, going to cider festivals, which I might find my way to one this weekend. But the, the people that say, that fall is elite. I don't know if I agree. I don't know if I agree. At any rate, I don't have a lot of time to talk about the weather. I barely have time to talk about Zach Benson and Matthew Savoy. I've hit on those guys, or at least uh, Benson anyways, um, in last week's episode. And if you've been able to check out some of the post-game sessions I've been doing during the preseason with Matthew Fairburn, uh, we've talked a lot about Benson. If you haven't checked out those videos, by the way, um, they're on the live tab on the YouTube channel. You can access them there. Some really good talks with Matthew after uh, a few of these Sabres preseason games. Love getting with Matthew. Love his insight. Um, just a very cool guy and a very smart uh, sports writer. Love what he does on the Sabres beat. I think to just put a bow on Benson, um, I'm really eager to see what he's able to do, you know, thinking that he was going to maybe have a letdown or kind of tail off or level off in the preseason. That never happened. He actually got better. And you look at that last Sabres preseason game against Pittsburgh. He was really good out there on that line with Casey Middlestat and Jordan Greenway. So there was no denying his spot on the roster. And now let's see what he does here in the first week or two of the regular season and see if he can keep being a factor that can help the Sabres win games. That's all there is to it. And then we get to figure out the Matthew Savoy piece of the puzzle. And I'm really eager to see how that plays out. I think, you know, the elevator speech on, on Savoy right now had a great year in junior last year, had a really solid off season working out, came into camp in great shape, fast, ready to go Sabres best player at the prospects challenge. In my opinion, then he has an unfortunate injury in the last prospects challenge game against Pittsburgh and that opportunity that he was going to seemingly have went to Benson. So now, uh, Savoy's back skating by all accounts, hasn't lost a step when he was out rehabbing that shoulder and he's going to force his way into some playing time at some point. We just don't know when, Will the Sabres elect to get him going with a conditioning stint in Rochester before getting him some NHL minutes? Maybe. But at any rate, starting the season on injured reserve, um, it's going to be really interesting to see what roster move the Sabres make to create space for Savoy when um, they do want to insert him into the NHL lineup. But at any rate, don't have a lot of time to talk about Savoy and Benson um, as much as I'd love to. I'm sure we'll get to them down the road. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to do so. There's just been so much going on with the other prospects that we need to just jump right in and get moving or I'll be here all night, which I don't want to do. I want to try to keep this as always around 30 minutes ish. And we're just going to dive right in and start tonight's episode in the college hockey ranks. Um, because if the opening weekend of action was any indication, UConn freshman Jake Richard could be poised to make an immediate impact on the hockey East scene. Richard opened up uh, his freshman campaign with a three point weekend and a set at Colgate. Um, you know, the Huskies went in there uh, with a unranked, but they have a decent roster this year. They can certainly compete in hockey East. Jake Richard looks to be starting the season on the second line, which is going to be centered by Matthew Wood, who big power forward type of body skill player. He's becoming a power forward. I don't think he's truly a power guy yet. Um, you know, he's got good hands, really good goal scoring instincts. We talked a lot about him in the draft this year because Wood was taken 15th overall in 2023 by the Nashville Predators. 
So it looks like Wood's going to be centering that line with Richard on the right wing. And then on the opposite wing is another NHL prospect uh, drafted in the 2020 draft in the seventh round by Detroit kid by the name of Chase Bradley. So that's a pretty good second line in hockey East this year, but Richard just, um, just jumped right in and I'm going to bring up his three points that he had over the weekend. And before I tee him up, because this, the first clip is going to develop very quickly. So I just want to tee it up properly before we get the video going. And I do want to apologize to those that are listening to the podcast audio only. This is a very video heavy episode of Prospect Avenue this week. Um, I'll do my best to put words to the pictures for you that are listening, but it would be, uh, this might be a good one to check out on YouTube when you have time. So with that said, we're going to get right into the Jake Richard highlight package. Richard's going to be wearing 11 in the dark jersey. And then this first clip, it's going to just start playing right away when I bring it up on the screen here. So he's going to go in, pressure a defender, and force a turnover with a stick, bat the puck out of the air, and quickly send a pass to Matthew Wood, who lets go of a nice one-timer. So let's just get that going here. Again, Richard, 11. He's going to be entering the right wing corner here, and he's going to quickly convert the turnover into a primary assist. So here's Richard. Stick on the puck quickly once it hits the ice, and he finds Matthew Wood for the pass. Let me back that up again so you can just kind of get a good look at it from the beginning. So the defenseman has the puck in the right wing corner. Richard is on him, and we'll let it rip here. Stick out, bats the puck down, quick pass to Wood for the big goal. That was the assist on UConn's first goal of the season on Saturday at Colgate. We'll probably get a bad angle replay here one time. Uh, you saw the play. If you want to see it from the other angle, here it is. Finds wood right there between the circles. Now, this is another assist that uh, Richard's going to get. He gets the puck in the neutral zone, kicks it over to a fenceman, and then goes in F1 on the four check and makes a nice backdoor pass from behind the net to Wood again for Wood's second goal of the season and Richard's second collegiate point. So really smart play by Jake Richard. Started the play in transition by kicking it over to a defenseman. The defenseman lofts the puck in and Richard's the first forward in on the four check, controls the puck, gets it back and makes a nice pass. Now, as pretty as those plays were, this is the prettiest one from Richard. He's going to get the puck here on the right side and zing. Nice far side wrist shot. That is a guy that scored 31 goals last year in 57 USHL games for Muskegon and Tri-City. Jake Richard ranked seventh in the USHL last year with those 31 goals. And you're seeing how he got it done. Really nice torque on the shot. Uses the defenseman as a screen and beats Carter Guylander a Detroit Red Wings prospect high over his shoulder for the beautiful goal. And that was Richard's first collegiate goal. You saw his teammate there, grab the puck, get that one up on the uh, mantle there for Drake Richard. So really nice start points in both games could be a seamless transition to college hockey for Jake Richard there with a goal and two assists for the Huskies against Colgate. We're going to keep the college train rolling here and get into a little discussion here on Steven Sardarian. Sardarian got his exhibition schedule going with a goal and an assist Saturday as New Hampshire traveled up to Colby College for a neutral site game in a 3-2 loss to Maine. And we'll just get this rolling here. Sardarian got the Wildcats on the board in the top half of the final period with a really deft redirection. So Sardarian's lined up here at the faceoff, wearing number seven, right there on the right wing boards. He's going to get a touch on the puck, and the play is going to eventually cycle around a little bit before Sardarian wearing seven. He's in pursuit there. He's going to get to the front of the net. And you see him calling for the puck there. Doesn't come to him immediately, but now he's in front of the net all alone. And he's going to get that puck back. Watch this play. Really nice redirection backwards between his legs to beat the Black Bears goaltender. And this is a very skilled player with a very smart stick, highly intelligent. So here's a replay again. Watch this redirect. Beautiful play, confident player. 
but he's super skilled with a stick. And like I said, highly intelligent. This is an assist here that Sedarian's going to get. Now he's on the bench right now, but you're going to see seven hop over the boards and race right down the left boards and force a turnover on the main defenseman. So here comes Sardarian and he's gotten on his horse here. Defenseman a little sleepy. Sardarian gets in there, passes the, now watch this eyes. Oh, look at that eyes in the back of his head. Let me back that up again because I didn't really articulate that properly. Sardarian's going to hop over the boards, force the defenseman into a turnover, take the puck behind the net. And he finds that back door kind of short side pass right on his line mates tape for a beautiful assist. So here comes Sardarian down the boards. Defenseman a little sleepy. Didn't even see Sardarian coming. Sardarian wins the battle. Watch his pass behind the net, right on the tape for the finish. And UNH ties the game late in the third. So, Love that play from Sardarian. Love that assist. Really nice playmaker. He could score goals, but he's definitely made his mark as a playmaker in the Russian junior ranks. Same thing when he got to Youngstown in the USHL two seasons ago. And, you know, he was a case study in adjusting to the pace of the play at the NCAA ranks and, uh, and strength of the opposition last season as a freshman. He didn't have any points in his first 17 appearances for the Wildcats went to the holiday break and then came back and had two goals and five assists in his final 11 games to kind of get some momentum going. He acclimated to the pace. He figured out a way to play with stronger opponents and then had a really nice off season this year, came to Sabres development camp, got more time in to play um, with his teammates and in, in unofficial practice sessions and unofficial skates with his Wildcats teammates over the summer. That's something that he didn't have an opportunity to do coming in as a freshman, as he kind of worked on his visa and, um, and all that. So he was a little bit behind the eight ball coming in as a freshman seems to have everything on a, a really solid path coming into his second season. So it was really nice to see Sardarian get on the board here with a goal and an assist and the Wildcats, they're going to open their season uh, with a strong, strong test right away as they take on the nation's top-ranked team, Boston University, on Friday on home ice. So good to see Sardarian get going, and we're going to keep the train moving here in college and just do a quick update on Matteo Costantini, who scored a power play goal over the weekend as Western Michigan defeated the U.S. under-18 team in an exhibition by a 9-4 score. You're going to see Costantini, 25 of the dark jersey. He's going to be in front of the net here on the power play. Uh, he's going to be in a battle, and you're going to see the defenseman just leave him momentarily. And fellow transfer Sam Colangelo is going to hit him with a pass. Uh, Costantini with a stick on the ice just deposits the puck into the net, and let's get that rolling here. So you see Costantini, 25 in the dark jersey at the edge of the crease. Colangelo right on his tape, and Costantini gets the goal. So... That's a uh, a good place, I think, for Costantini to start. Um, getting some power play time. This was his debut in the Western Michigan sweater, or I guess jersey. We don't call them sweaters anymore. But just like we talked about Sardarian and Richard poised to get their season started in a good direction, same thing here with Costantini. He looks really poised to get his NCAA career back on track after an up and down first two years with the University of North Dakota. So let's just kind of rewind a little bit. You know, Cosentini comes in to North Dakota as a freshman. He gets eight goals and 21 points in his first year, playing kind of a middle six role, sometimes played up on the top line, but was mostly second, third line guy. So has the 21 points. Um, he earns a spot on the NCHC all rookie team. He's feeling good comes back for a second season as a sophomore and finds himself relegated to a fourth line role. Sometimes he was scratched. He played just 25 games, had two goals and an assist, and he elected to transfer. Goes to Western Michigan. Looks like he's on a really good path to get his career back on track here in the NCAA. Looks like he's firmly in place as the Broncos second line centerman. Broncos have a lot of new faces this year. I think they brought in five transfers, Constantini being one of them. Sam Colangelo will be his line mate 
he's another one of those transfers who's coming off three years, especially the last two very solid ones at Northeastern. Colangelo was a second round draft pick of the Anaheim Ducks in 2020. It's a pretty high draft pick to be in the Western Michigan program. He's going to be skating with Constantini, it looks like, at least to start the year. But a nice start. Good to see Constantini get going after kind of the rough down year that he had last year when he was still part of that North Dakota program. And we'll see what uh, happens here and see if they can keep that going, the Colangelo Costantini chemistry when they kick off regular season play on Thursday and Friday with a home and home set against Ferris state. We're going to bounce over now to Russia. Keep this train moving here. Uh, trying to make this, like I said, a 30 minute podcast. I've already chewed up about half of my time and we'll go to Russia real quick for another check-in on pro corporal top off because on Monday, He kept making the most of his fourth line minutes with his fourth goal of the season. And we're just going to bring it up here as he gets in deep on a dump in that rebounded off the goaltender. He goes in for a nice wraparound goal. Like I said, his fourth goal of the season. Poltapov also had two takeaways in this 3-2 overtime win over Sochi. There you see Poltapov go in, had a defender on him. He just peels off him, gets the puck, and goes right around the back of the net for the wraparound. His fourth goal in nine games. Poltapov got decent ice time today, skating for 12 minutes and 43 seconds. That's a good sign for him to get that many minutes in a close game. A lot of times, anytime Poltapov has over eight and a half, nine minutes, it's usually in a blowout. I think what was also cool amongst those 18 shifts that Poltapov logged today was he had a minute 33 of power play time. In his previous eight games, Poltapov had a a combined 18 seconds of work with a man advantage. So for him to pick up a minute 33 time, uh, it kind of shows you that the plan is working for Poltapov coming into this season. You wanted him to start low in the lineup, work his way up, prove his value to Sergei Fedorov and the staff. And I think the fact that he's getting some looks on the power play is a move in the right direction for him. And hopefully he can continue to maybe get into a third line role, maybe a second line role as we go. Again, this was a player who last season started on the second line with Kamenov. Um, but right now he's been forced downward in the lineup on the fourth line. But again, currently the third most goals on the team, uh, four goals through nine games. He's on pace for one hell of a, a Cy Young stat line. He's on pace for 27 goals and no assists this season in the KHL. But you know, if I set a baseline for just 10 goals this year, right now it's looking like, um, at least here in the second week of October, that he's well on his way to eclipsing that number put in place for him. So we like what we're seeing from Poltapov, and we're just going to keep going here and do a little bit of a check-in on Viljami Mariala. And what I did this week um, was cut up some game tape from about a week and a half ago. This was a game that I'm going to get rolling here that it was a a game where he skated for 1148 of ice. He only recorded one shot on goal, didn't have any points and a three, one loss to Asat. But I just wanted to show some Sabres fans, the type of player that Mariala is um, and really show his comfort level with the puck. So it's kind of a, a neutral setting. I'm not cherry picking goal highlights here to show of Mariala. It's just a random game tape from September 30th. Um, I have his full shift work video about 16 and a half, 17 minutes of actual video that I compiled uh, for his game that maybe I'll put up in full on the YouTube channel, but I kind of pulled some best of moments. So I guess it is kind of cherry picked in a way. Um, I pulled out some of his best moments in about five minutes or so of shift work. Um, Mariella did score, by the way, a goal last week. He again showed that really quick release Wednesday in a loss to HPK. Uh, Very similar to the first goal that he scored this season where he just came down and ripped a laser from the left wing circle um, to get his second goal of the season. But let's just get the play, uh, the tape rolling here, excuse me, on this package that I put together. Again, just to show folks Mariala's skating, his puck handling ability, because one of the things you're going to notice in this package is his puck handling skill 
makes for some really seamless zone entries. It makes him a guy that his line mates, especially the defensemen, are always looking for to get the puck to so they can gain the zone and set the attack up and, and try to get some offensive plays going. So let's just get this rolling. Marial is going to be wearing 20 in white in this game. Gets the puck right here. This is going to be one of those zone entries, but he skates into four guys and quickly gets the puck up. So this will just kind of keep rolling again. Mariala, 20 in white. This is a play here where he crashes the net, a little fumbled uh, rebound from the goaltender, and that was uh, a nice scoring opportunity there for Mariala in this game. Nothing came of it. Again, they didn't get a lot of offense TPS uh, did in this game. It was a 3-1 loss to a set. Here's one where the defense kind of circles around for a little bit. And this is an example where they just have to find Mariala before they can get anything going. So here's Mariala, nice zone entry. Guys converge on him. He calmly dishes the puck off and gets off the ice for a change. So again, gains the zone. Checkers converge on him. He controls the puck and dishes it off. Now, this is an example of TPS kind of circling around for a bit. And they can't break out until Mariala comes into the picture and gets himself open. So here he's at the bottom of the screen, circling into the zone, goes backwards, pivots, makes himself available. One quick tap of the stick calls for the puck and he gains the zone. Mariala here in front of the net. I think this is the shift where he's going to actually attack the net from the right corner and get a scoring opportunity. Yeah, let's see here. So they're going to gain the zone again. Mariella goes to the net, stick on the ice. Okay, he's going to go to the right corner and get the puck here, and he's going to make a nice cut inside and take it to the net with a nice power move. Cuts inside, goes to the net. Again, we like the mentality there. He's not sticking on the perimeter looking for a pass. Takes it hard to the net. Nothing came of it, and he gets off the ice. This is going to be another um, transition here for Mariella. Gains his own, drops it off, offsides. But again, they look to get him the puck as the centerman carries it over three lines into the offensive zone. Nothing comes of it. And he goes to the bench. A little disappointed there with the offside call. Here's another example of where Mariala is going to get the puck. Gain the zone. And try to set up a teammate. And it does eventually lead to a shot attempt there from range. A couple other highlights here as we just wrap up the package. Mariala wins the draw in the defensive zone, gets the puck, makes himself available, by the way, at his own blue line, takes the puck, they gain the zone, and it's going to lead to an icing call here eventually as the puck will come all the way back down the ice. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is not that play. This is the play where he just gets swallowed up, loses his bucket here, and has to get off the ice. That was a short shift. This is a play here. Calls for the puck, gets it, takes it over three lines, dishes it off. And this was the one that actually leads to an ice and call. But again, another zone entry. Mariala, they're looking for him on the breakout, gets the puck, and... Gains the zone. Now here's Mariala around the net. That a boy getting into it here with Vertanen. You're going to see a couple of replays of this because I have like 17 million replays of this play. Mariala not backing down here. Um, the puck, you know, there's a, a scramble in the goal mouth. The TPS goalie looks to cover it. Mariala actually looks to, he almost fights his goalie for the puck, but then ultimately lets his goalie have it for the cover. Mariala gets his hands up and gets Vertanen on the chin, and that's why Vertanen goes after him. And we like Mariala not backing down. So here he is right here. Now watch what happens. This kind of comes up, little little action on the chin there. Nothing crazy, but enough to, I mean, I'd, I'd be pretty upset too if I was Vertanen in red. I don't want to take a shot to the, uh, to the chin or the mouth area, especially from some 20-year-old punk here a rookie. <laughs> so Vertanen takes exception. Mariala eventually drops his twig and engages in the battle. And this last sequence here, this is Mariala with the extra attacker. Really nice zone entry here. Let me back that one up because that was really smooth puck handling as he navigates through two Assad defenders. So Mariala is going to come through, carry it into the neutral zone and watch the stick handling on play. Just nice carry, nice little drag back, gains his own. 
throws it deep. Now, this last minute here, this whole sequence, Mariel is kind of running the whole show for TPS. They don't really get any offensive opportunities until he gets the puck. So this is now where they start generating chances. Mariel is behind the net, kicks it high. He's going to get it back here. And then he's going to start looking to make things happen. Takes it behind the net, throws it to the side, one shot attempt. TPS is going to gather the puck and then Mariala calls for it and he gets it back here beneath the goal line, back in his office, goes back door, nothing happening, retrieves the puck. Mariala eventually will get it back again. He's always calling for it. You see the stick tap on the ice. Mariala sends a cross ice pass, no one home. He's going to call for it again, gets it back, takes it to the net. Throws a pass, nothing happens. Time's going to expire. But again, just wanted to kind of show you, they're trying to run that offense through Mariala. He always looks good with the extra attacker. Um, in this case here, in a six on five, you know, he does really well as a playmaker, especially when he has room. But that's kind of what he's doing this year. He's really gaining attention Liga wide with his playmaking ability, with his puck handling ability. And I just, like I said, it wasn't, um, this crazy offensive performance by any means that I just showed you here on video wanted to give folks that weren't familiar with his style of play, an idea of how he looks at a professional level and how he's contributing to the TPS attack, because we could talk about his counting stats. This is a player. He has two goals and seven total points through 10 games. Good for third on the team in scoring. He's on a 42 point pace, but sometimes it's good to put some color to the numbers. And that's what I wanted to do there. Again, a 42 point pace, by the way, that's pretty good for a soon to be 21 player. He'll be 21 in late January. So let's keep moving here. And we're going to hop back to North America, to the Canadian junior ranks. Last week in Prospect Avenue, we showed you three goals that Ethan Miedema scored. We showed you a pair of goals that he scored on breakaways. We showed you another at the side of the net on the power play. Well, in this episode, we're going to show you uh, Ethan Miedema's NHL caliber wrist shot with a power play goal, his fourth of the season in Kingston's 5-2 win over Ottawa on Sunday. So Miedema's going to get the puck off the draw here, 15 and white. Right here, top of the circle, steps in, torque on the stick, and unleashes an absolute laser. We're going to see this again. A couple replay angles here. Really nice goal from Miedema. That was the power play game winner. He has team best of four goals at eight points through five games this season. Again, really nice shot, high glove side. Miedema has 14 shots on goal this year, so he's firing at a 28.5% success rate. Not sure he can sustain that all year, but needless to say, really good to see him scoring goals in a variety of ways. We talked about Kingston really needing for him to get going early, and he's, he's living up to that pedigree of an NHL draft pick with his early season production. So he's amongst the OHL leaders in goals and points leading Kingston right now in pretty much every offensive category except shots on goal. And that's a really good start to the season for the Frontenac's winger. We're going to keep it rolling here in the CHL and uh, talk briefly about Matt's Lindgren. He picked up a pair of assists Friday, both of them by getting shots to the net in a 6-2 loss to Prince Albert. And we'll just show you those here. Uh, shot Latimer save. Hildebrand so the Lindgren up at the top of the point here in white. Play. Lindgren, middle point. Wrist shot. Score! Fires on net there. Let me kill that audio. Lindgren, 27 and white. Wrist shot. Tipped in front by Carson Latimer for a goal. And you're going to see another similar play here when he skates down the left side and fires a puck to the net. That also leads to a goal. Another one by Latimer. So Red Deer is still adjusting to some new systems this year with a new coach. Um, Lindgren remarked as much about that in an interview that he recently did for the Red Deer Rebels website. Uh, you can go and find that interview that he did on the website. Just uh, some highlights that I jotted down here that I wanted to pass along from that interview. He just talked about how he had an awesome experience in Sabres camp. This was his second camp. He felt more confident, more acclimated to the system. 
Um, he even got into his first NHL exhibition game, getting a shot on goal and an assist against the Bruins. He remarked about how different the NHL game is. And it was really interesting for him to talk about how it's just more controlled. You hear that a lot when players jump up levels. Noah Oslin has talked about that as well. When he moved from Hockey Elsvenskin up to the SHL this, this year, talked about how it's easier to play in a system where everyone's in the right spot. I think that's kind of what Lindgren picked up when he was skating with the Tage Thompsons and the Jeff Skinners and the Rasmus Dahlins of the world. He also mentioned that, you know, his offensive game, you know, the skill levels there helped him fit in. His skating game certainly helped him blend in. But he remarked about how challenging the defensive side is. And he even cited, you know, how you have to keep your head up when you have guys like Milan Lucic bearing down on you. And yes, um, I would say no kidding, right? Like it's certainly very difficult playing in juniors and then going up and playing against elite players at the NHL level. But, um, you know, obviously good for him to kind of verbalize it because he's taken this whole, you know, it was right when he got back from Sabres camp when he did this interview and he's processing the experience and he was just, you can kind of hear it in his words that he was, um, just very excited and grateful for the opportunity. And he's looking to really capture that experience and bring it back to have a successful season in Red Deer. He talked about carrying extra weight this year, and it's made his life easier, both at Sabres camp, but also um, already paying off for him in his WHL season. He's uh, got the six foot frame, but he put on 12 pounds of muscle. And the way that he did that this year was for the first two months of his off season, not skating at all, just focusing on the weight training and focusing on his gym work. Once he got through those two months, he started to mix in a different part of his program where he was working out, um, twice a day and then skating three times a week. So again, just went hard with the weights, didn't skate at all. And then later on in the summer, got back on the ice and really started ramping up three times a week. thought that was kind of interesting as well. I mean, that's one way to put on mass. It's very difficult to add mass throughout the course of the season. Um, so for him to really attack it and put on 12 pounds of muscle, I think that says a lot about his commitment to getting better. He's already talked about um, how it's paid off for him. It's obviously just makes him stronger to have leverage in the corners and his defensive side of it, but it's helped with the shot. It's made him faster. You know, the whole program, again, just to reset it with Lindgren, it's about leveling out his two-way responsibilities. The offensive game is there. You see it um, in the highlight packages that we've showed here now in the last two episodes of Prospect Avenue. He can contribute in the offensive zone, but for him to really get that NHL contract, Sabres have to have confidence in his defensive zone development. Adding that strength, winning battles will certainly help him do so. But needless to say, Lindgren's doing well offensively. He's got points in all three games since going back to Red Deer, um, and he has a goal and three assists along the way. And lastly this week, in terms of highlights, we're going to go to the QMJHL and check in on Sevalad Komarov, who returned from his lower body injury Friday, recording a pair of assists in Quebec's game against Val d'Or. And we'll just throw this up here immediately and get right to it. Komarov with two assists, one on a, a missed outlet that was turned into kind of an area pass here. And you're going to see that right away. Komarov just throws the puck to the left wing side, missed two players, but 37 comes down and scores with a nice goal there. Nicely placed shot. And Komarov will later get his second assist of the game when they swing the puck to him on the right side. And he's going to just get a little work uh, wide to get his right shot through for a nice deflection in front. So they're going to swing it over to Komarov here. He's going to take a step or two to the right side, squeeze that puck through for a nice goal. And that's his second assist of the season, second assist of the game. Komarov then came out on Saturday and hopped over the boards as Quebec's fifth shooter in the shootout, goes down and scores um, the clincher in a 3-2 win over Valdor. We're going to see that here momentarily. Kind of funny always to see defensemen come out in the shootout. We like that. But we're going to get to that here. 
And here he comes, 83 in red, comes down. He's going to slow up a little bit, Kuznetsov style. Not too slow. Comes in, picks a spot, goes off the post and in with a nice forehand. You know, Patrick Waugh said this kid had moves when he was drafted. And, you know, he looks pretty comfortable carrying that puck and a couple stick handles there before getting the shot off. So good to see. But Komarov now in his second QMJHL season, they have a lot of confidence in him offensively. Again, he's a defenseman. They're using him in the shootout. Just wanted to share that clip with you because we like when defensemen get out there in the shootout. So good for Seve getting his season going with two assists for his first two games and contributing with a shootout winner. We're going to continue on here. It's just a couple quick injury updates before we close out this week's edition of Prospect Avenue. Uh, Anton Wahlberg with Malmo. He slid to a lower line role last Wednesday in Malmo's 6-3 loss to Lin Chiping. And in that game, suffered an undisclosed injury that kept him out of their weekend contest. So more to come on that. We'll be looking to see uh, if he's going to be out for uh, an extended period, or if it was just a short-term thing, hopefully we get to see him back in the Red Hawks lineup sooner rather than later. Tri-City defenseman Sean Cohane, he continues to sit out on injured reserve to start the season as the Storm have gotten off to a 4-2 and two start in the USHL's Western Conference. And we're getting to that point now in October uh, where Topias Lanen and watch is probably on now. He has to be getting close to returning. Mid-October was the initial target from for his return from that lower body injury. Uvescula is likely ready for his return. If you recall, we talked in the European preview that JYP was pretty excited to have their goaltending situation kind of settled after having five different goalkeepers last year in their season before Vaney Vavalainen came in and settled things. Um, Vavalainen came back this year uh, and was going to be working as the clear number one in tandem with the young netminder and Leinenin. Leinenin, um ideally would have been pushing Vaini Vevalainen for some starts. Well, Leinenin gets hurt in preseason, and then Vevalainen plays three games before getting hurt. So then JYP has now been functioning for the bulk of their season with two goalies that weren't initially on their training camp roster. So they got to be chomping at the bit to get the Sabres prospect back in the nets. Not sure if they're going to roll him out with some uh, under-20 league starts or if they're just going to throw him right back to the Wolves when he is healthy. But needless to say, we're here in the second week of October. We're approaching that time uh, when he should be back on the ice soon, at least practicing, and we'll be on the lookout for updates and we'll share with you the news as it comes down. Last but not least, really excited to get the AHL going this Friday when the Amherst open their season on home ice against Bridgeport. And I think the Russians are coming. Um, at least they were on Friday when the Amherst took a 4-3 OT win at Utica. Alexander Kizikov netted a pair of goals, including the OT winner. He also had an assist for a three-point night. Kizikov also had an assist on Thursday when the Amherst opened their two-game preseason with a 4-2 win over Syracuse. So, Nice four-point preseason for Kizikov, but also in that Friday win um, at Utica, Nikita Novikov on the back end with three assists. Viktor Nyachev had an assist, so he also had an assist in the Thursday win against Syracuse for uh, assists in both of his preseason games. So really good to see those guys going. Kizikov was the only Russian last year. Maybe felt like he was on an island a little bit. You know, maybe having some countrymen with him this year in his second North American professional season is going to be one of those things that help helps light the fire underneath him to get him going. And I think four points in his first two preseason games is a nice starting point for Kizikov. And, you know, you throw a guy like that into the mix with Kulik and Rosane and Rusek and some of the other young guys. Um, the Amherst could be a pretty tough out this year in the American Hockey League, and that'll be great to see. I think that's it. We covered a lot of ground here this week on Prospect Avenue. Again, if you were listening audio only, I apologized for the heavy video clip episode this week. Please do check it out on YouTube, though, if you are listening audio. And um, we're going to do this, like I said, every week. And uh, if you've been checking in on some of the post-game live chats with Matthew Fairburn at The Athletic, we're looking to do that uh, as often as possible this season as well. 
more to come on what the strategy is with working with Matthew, but we're going to cook something up for you guys and to give you plenty of content this season, both covering the Sabres proper as well as here on Prospect Avenue with the developing prospects. That'll do it for this week. Thank you as always for stopping by Prospect Avenue and we will see you next time.